Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Emmanuel. My name is Greg Kowser. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, and we're in the midst of a study in a, in a little book by Paul uh, to one of his closest, closest protégés and disciples in the gospel, and his name was Timothy, a young man, maybe uh, in his late 20s, early 30s, who's been tasked with a really difficult job. And so I want to invite you to open your scriptures, if you have them, whether it's electronic or in your hand, uh, open them to 2 Timothy. We want to read our passage as we get underway, uh, as we get started. Thanks so much for uh, Grayson and team for leading us in worship. Uh, that, that last song that we sing, uh, Come Thou Fount of Blessing, uh, it resonates with us all so much because of the realization that everything that we need for life and blessing comes from Christ, but it also reminds us of uh, if we reflect on just this past week, how our hearts are prone to wander uh, from the goodness of God. So thank God that he's merciful. Thank God that his mercies are ever new uh, as he gets started. Well, we're in 2 Timothy, in the little book of 2 Timothy. We're in chapter 2. Uh, Pastor Steve took us through chapters, or verses 1 through 7 last week, uh, talking about the command of Timothy to be strong in the grace which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, and he told Timothy to pass on uh, what he had learned to other faithful men who would be able, again, to pass it on to those down the road. And so this uh, pattern of, of taking what we've learned and passing it on to the next generation uh, is the way the people of God maintain their faithfulness to him over the, the, the decades, the millennia, until Christ returns. And he gave Timothy some guidance he says, if you're going to be a, uh, someone who stays at the task, you've got to be a soldier because you're in a battle. You've got to be a soldier who lives to please the one who enlisted you, Christ. Uh, and if you're a soldier, you don't get entangled in civilian affairs. You don't get wrapped up in things that are outside your mission. And you've got to stay in the rules. You've got to play according to the rules if you want to compete and win. Uh, and he talks about the idea that as a follower of Christ, we need to follow Christ not only to represent him with our words, but represent him with our lives. And the only way to live out our lives in Christ is to follow him completely. And that if you're the one who works hard, uh, there will be fruit, right, from your labor that you will experience in your life. And then he promises that God will allow, uh, that God will work so that Timothy can live into those truths. Not that they're just mottos, but things that he will understand and embrace. Well, now he's going to change, and he's going to change from be strong in the grace in Christ, and now he wants to command him to remember something. And what's interesting, the way Paul says this in both places, these are constant things. When he says remember something, it might be a, a way to think of it as constantly call to mind, constantly call these things to mind, because these truths need to always be in the forefront of your thinking. Right? So it's not remember like in a nostalgic moment where you step back and you uh, uh, pull out the old uh, albums and you, you know, waft your way through the past years of your life and look at your kids who used to be small and cute and now they're big and troublesome, right? Whatever it was that you look back uh, as you look in life and so it becomes nostalgia. No, this is looking back. This is opening up your marriage album if you're a married person. And looking back, and hopefully maybe you've done this, and you look back and you read your vows that you gave your wife or your husband. And you recall the commitment that you made that needs to shape the way you treat your wife or your husband today. And so this is the kind of remembrance that he has. So would you just join with me and stand and let me read this passage for you? We're going to read uh, chapter 2, verse 8, down through verse 13. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. May you be seated. 
Now, I want to encourage you, uh, if you have your scriptures too, uh, I hope you come uh, with a, a something to write with or uh, something you can type something in with here as you're here. Um, but there's a, a set of notes in your bulletin. I really want to encourage you to get those. Number one, uh, I want you to kind of help you to listen as you walk your way through, but also to have something that you remember and you carry away from today. So you want to take those notes out, and I'll try to be uh, faithful and let you fill in the uh, blanks. Now, here's the first blank to fill in, and the very first one. Choose your hard, right? Now, I don't know if any of you have heard that phrase, right? It's a kind of a contemporary phrase. Uh, it shows up in the area of, like, weight loss or fitness, right, or any of those kinds of things along those lines. Choose your hard, and life is hard. And here's the, the blank. Choose the good hard. Choose the good hard. Okay? Life is hard. Choose the good heart. Now, when you look at, at uh, the storyline in Scripture, and we just sang it in, this, in uh, the song just preceding uh, Fount of Blessing, it was a wonderful story that recounts the storyline of Scripture. And when you read the storyline of Scripture, right, the, the God created the world, and as He created the world, He brought human beings into the world to be in this intimate relationship with Him. And our forebears, Adam and Eve, decided that they could do better on their own. And they rebelled against God and turned from Him, and it brought chaos into their lives. And the whole biblical storyline is God in His grace and mercy, His undeserved favor, and His compassion uh, making a way, a provision for men and women to come back into that intimacy that they forfeited when they rebelled against Him. Right? So the whole storyline is about that. And so the biblical story assumes that humanity is in rebellion against God. And it also assumes that there's only two types of, re, uh, of humanity, right? There's not, uh, again, we could talk about different races. We could talk about different places on the go, globe. We could talk about male, female. We could talk about different uh, groups of people co according to the stages and stages. But in the biblical storyline, there's just two groups of people. There's those who, who submit to God's loving will and come back into a relationship with him. And there's those who persist in resisting God's grace and mercy and walk away from him. And so the whole biblical storyline assumes that there's these two paths. That's why when you come to Jesus, right, one of his famous sayings is Jesus says, choose the narrow path. Don't go down the broad path. Right? And if somebody walked up to Jesus and say, what about if I want to go on the medium-sized path, right? I want to go on the medium-sized path. I don't want to go on the broad path or the narrow path. I want to go on the medium-sized path. I want to be in the middle. And Jesus says, there is no middle. There's no middle. There's either those who submit to me by faith and those who walk away from me in rebellion. Right? And so the whole biblical storyline is, is telling human beings who they are, how they've been created, what they've been made for, where life is really found. And Jesus is the ultimate provision of God to restore that relationship that's been broken. And so Jesus comes. He comes into the world. He takes on human identity. Right? He becomes a human. He takes on humanity because a human needs to pay for what humans have done. God is a just God. He cannot just look over things as if it didn't happen. So Jesus comes in. He lives the life that Adam never lived. Right? He lives the perfect life. And so when he goes up onto the cross to give himself as a sacrifice for our benefit, he does it as the perfect sacrifice, not someone who needs to be uh, atoned for himself or have his sins covered. No, he goes up to cover our sins. So he takes in his death, he takes into himself what you and I deserve, right? So he takes away the hostility, the enmity that's caused because of our sin and God's justice coming against it. He takes care of that. And the, and the way that we benefit from Christ's death is we believe on Him. We say, yes, you are our Savior. Yes, you are the one who died in our place. But He not only died, He went into the grave, and then He came out of the grave and won the life for us that we had lost. So when we believe on Christ, we get to participate in the benefits of His death. And we believe on Christ, we get to participate in the benefits of His resurrection. So that we've not only been forgiven, we've not only had God's wrath removed against us, from against us, but now we've been brought into a relationship with him and brought back into the life that God wanted us to have. So Jesus is that provision. But the biblical storyline makes it clear that even if you're someone today who has believed on Jesus Christ and you're no longer stiff-arming God and walking away from him, the program of God bringing you to life is not complete. 
Matter of fact, we're waiting for Jesus to come, right? The story that we, we, we sang through, we're waiting for Jesus to come and bring true harmony and peace. The biblical term is shalom. We're waiting for him to come. There'll be a day when there won't be hostility against God. There'll be a day when there won't be disease and suffering. There'll be a day when it won't be marked by difficulties and hardship. And there'll be a day that everything will be resolved in the end. And the reason why we trust God that he can do that is because he's been faithful to every one of his promises in the past. Right? And the God who created everything can certainly resolve everything. And the God who brought Jesus from the empty tomb and the God who can deal with the sins of humanity is a God who can right all things. Right? So we trust him for that. But in the meantime, in the meantime, we as the people of God are going to endure hardship. Right? Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, if you've been reading in 2 Timothy. Um, when we, we talk to each other as followers of Christ, one of the things that we don't usually do with people, right, is uh, we got a, a group of uh, people coming together for a ministry, right, say at a given moment, like they're go we're going to go out and serve in the community, or we're going to go out and, and follow Christ into our schools, or whatever we're going to do. We never usually say, come on to come together with me and let's endure hardship together. I mean, we just don't do that. Right? Or when we get married, we want to say, I love you. Will you marry me? Yes, we'll come together. Let's endure hardship together, honey. And you're thinking, wait a minute. That's not what I'm thinking about. Right? You're my brother in Christ. Come on, brother. Let's come and endure hardship together. Why can't you say something a little bit more positive, Greg? Like, come, let's have fun together. Right? Come, let's have the best of lives that we're going to have now. Let's that kind of thing. Greg, why can't you be more positive? Right? Why do you have to talk about enduring hardship? And what I want to suggest to you here, Timothy, he opens up to Timothy in chapter 1. He said, Timothy, endure hardship. And here it's presupposed that you're going to endure hardship because Paul believes the biblical storyline that we're in a moment where we're waiting for the king to come back and fix everything. And until he fixes everything, you're going to endure hardship. And so we still live, right, in case we need to be reminded, we still live in a world that's broken because of sin. It's cursed. Right? We've had people this year who have just been on the brink of death because of disease and challenges. Right? It's broken into our lives in, in a crazy way with COVID. Right? We, it's been hovered over us for the last year and a half. Right? We live in a world that's broken with things in it that are threats to our physical existence. We live there. Right? And not only that, right, we live in a world where as we follow Jesus, the world is swimming the other direction. Right? As we, by God's grace and His mercy, swim along the current of His grace and mercy, we've got a lot of other people that are swimming the other direction. And as you're going down the path, they're swimming the other direction, and some of them are trying to encourage you to turn around and go that direction with them, right? And so you've got the opposition. As a matter of fact, some of them are in power, and some of them are very successful, and some of them seem to have uh, every uh, partner that they would desire, and they seem to live beautiful lives and powerful lives. And it's a compelling kind of cross-current that's pushing against us to think that, is this really the path? Right? And this has been true of God's people through the centuries. Right? One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 73. And I return to Psalm 73 every so often. Because Asaph, who is the leader, he's the Grayson of the Old Testament temple, right? He's the music leader of the Old Testament temple. And Asaph is supposed to be up there leading the congregation in worship to God. And Asaph has a woe is me moment, a self-pity party, and he just writes it out. He tells us about what happened to him. He was looking around, and he saw all the people who were rejecting God, and it seemed like they were doing really well. It seemed like they were happy. They were arrogant, they were speaking, they were wagging their tongues against heaven, right, challenging God, and God apparently wasn't doing anything to them. And to use the Old Testament terminology, they were fat, right, which was a good thing to say about them in the Old Testament, right, not so much to say about somebody today, like, you're really fat uh, as a compliment, right, is not something we use today. But that meant that you were flourishing, it, that meant that you were healthy, it meant that you were doing really well, right. As an aside, I remember this when we went to Togo, West Africa, where Sharon is serving, Sharon Rahali, and a compliment that you can give, one of the best compliments you can give to a man's wife and to the man itself is to say that your wife is really fat. 
because that means that you're doing really well and your family's doing well because most people there are super, super skinny because they don't have much to eat, right? Now, most of, of the women coming from America to get that kind of compliment didn't take it so well, right, in terms of that, right? Looks like you're doing really well. Your wife is fat. And, no, no, don't say that, right? So the issue here is, is that in, in, in Psalm 73, he's looking around and he says, these people are powerful, they're successful, they seem to be doing well. And, and Asaph just falls right into a pit and he goes, well, I've cleansed my hands for nothing. I've followed God for nothing. What has it gotten me? My life is difficult, and he just bottoms out. The psalm literally is a free fall, the first half of the psalm, and the last half of the psalm is him climbing out on the other side. Okay? And so if you're a follower of Christ, you know that the difficulties of living in a fallen world, you will taste them. Right? You will taste them in terms of disease. You will taste them in terms of the financial uh, stresses that are coming upon our own country. You'll taste them in terms of violence and natural disasters. All those things are happening, right? And you'll face people who are moving in the other direction who view you as a fool, who view you as even not only a fool, but somebody who actually is hostile to them and somebody who's inviting them to live in some vision of life that's actually oppressive. For you to think that there should be a man and a woman in marriage and that's what marriage should be, well, that's oppressive. Right? For you to think that you should be committed to your husband and wife for your lifetime, that's oppressive. Right? To think that, they're, that men uh, could be, according to the scriptures, good brothers, husbands, right? who, who think about women in a particular way, well, no, no, that's just promoting toxic male masculinity. Right? All that kind of thing is the world in which we live, uh, where we are, so you're going to find opposition in today in the moment where you and I live, especially in America, we're beginning to see it in ways that many of us who are older are not familiar with in the past. It used to be that if you were a follower of Christ, that your ethic, the way you viewed life and how you behaved, it overlapped the culture significantly. And so it was respectable to be a Christian. Now, not so much. Now, not so much, right, in terms of that. So you're going to get that. And then as we sang in our song, you know the reality of the fallen world. You know that we're not there yet because you struggle with sin in yourself, the darkness in your own soul, right? And if you're a follower of Christ, right, repentance is a part of your regular vocabulary because followers of Christ are tempted and they lust and they get full of themselves and they're, they're arrogant and prideful. They're fearful when God says, don't be afraid, Right? All those things happen. That's the nature of life in a fallen world. So we know in terms of our inner world, we know the call of the wild, to use that phrase. Right? We know the attractions of the fallen world. And we're attracted to power. We're attracted to, we're, we're attracted to get out there on Twitter and slay people. We're attracted to that. We're attracted uh, to being popular. We're attracted to being the person that everybody wants to hang on everything in our life. We're attracted to those things. And so we want to elevate ourselves. We want to put ourselves above God and dictate to God what he should do. That's all about it, okay? So that's the world in which we live. So we live in a moment that we're, we're swimming against the tide of our times and the tide of every time until Christ returns. That's where we are. We have things within us and outside us that are oppressing us. This is why for Paul... He assumes that every day is a day that you're in a battle, okay? Now, we don't like to think of it that way, right? We think that, you know, I'm not in a battle until I see that one person that I'm in a battle with, right? Unless they're around, I'm okay, but when they show up, now I know I'm in a battle, right? But what Paul wants to say is we're in a battle right within your own hearts. I mean, the, the battle is within you. The battle is to see yourself as someone created by God and responsible to him and who needs him for everything. The battle is to trust him that when he tells you how to live, that that's the best way to live. The battle is within your own heart to put him first and put yourself below him every day, right? So that he governs your tongue, that he governs what you listen to, governs the way you interact with other people the way you spend your money, right? All of that is the battle that we're in every day. 
And so we're, there's cross currents that are pushing against us as we're swimming in the tide of God's mercy and grace. And they're pushing against us. Some of them are even hostile to us. And we've got a battle within and we've got a battle outside. So this means, right, that life is hard no matter which path you take. Okay, and there's going to some lessons here. We want to come after that. This is, there's the bad hard, and Scripture wants to say this. The bad hard is the, the path of death to death. Okay? What I mean by death to death is it's going to kill off the life that God wants you to have now, and it's going to lead ultimately to a separation from God. The biblical idea of death has more to do with your relationship with God than your physical state of being, right? Every person right now who gives God the stiff arm and says, God, I don't want anything to do with you, I can make it on my own, right? They're dead, meaning they're separated from the source of genuine life. And so they're cut off from him. And in the end, if they persist in their rebellion, they will be dead forever because they will be cut off from him. Okay? So why scripture can talk about the second death in that regard. And so, and then there's another path, right, which is the good hard path to use this way, the path of life to life to come, right? But the key thing is there is no easy path though there is the right path that is truly life-giving now and fully in the age to come. But there's no easy path. So now, Paul's going to advise Timothy. He's kind of three things he's going to, to ask questions, he's going to answer these kinds of questions. Okay, and they're, they're the questions that we want to get as we read Timothy's, Paul's advice to Timothy. So here's the first one. How do you keep from being dragged upstream against God's grace and mercy with those who are fighting it. How do you keep from getting dragged upstream? And I say upstream because um, upstream against God's grace and mercy. If you're a high school student, you are bombarded with social media trying to tell you who you are, and very few of those voices align with God's voice. If we, in the culture in which we live, the world that's created in the world in which we live is not faithful or friendly to the mind of God. So how do you keep from being dragged upstream against God's grace and mercy with those fighting it? Second question, how do you stay in the current of God's loving will in the face of opposition? How do you stay on mission in the face of opposition? How do you do that? Right. Okay, now opposition come, can come within you and around you. Right. And sometimes, right, the opposition comes from the people that we love who are having a bad day themselves, who are caught up in sin themselves, who are heading in the wrong direction. How do you stay on mission? And then thirdly, how do you keep God's heart for those who are resisting God's grace and mercy and who may see your proclamation of the gospel in the way you live and in what you say as oppressive, hateful, or just stupid? Okay? So this is not stealing your heart over against people who've rejected God. You are, if you're a follower of Jesus, who you are by the grace of God. God rescued you in your rebellion and brought you to himself. You did not attain anything. You did not get a reward because you were such a good person, right? You were walking away from him in his grace and mercy. He brought you to himself. So how do you keep from getting, becoming this embattled, bittered person as you do this? So here's the three pieces of advice. And so, if you've got your notes, let me start filling in some more of your blanks, right, that are here, okay? <clears throat> so, first thing, endure hardship by remembering the gospel truths about Jesus. Remember the gospel truths about Jesus, okay? So, here's what he says in uh, verse 8. Remember, Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David, this is my gospel, okay? Now, what's interesting here is why these two truths? Why does Paul say that, Timothy, you need to remember these things? Okay? And we're going to ask this when we get to the end of this little section here. Uh, it's provocative to think about what sort of truths about God and about what he's doing in Christ, what he has done, what he will do, should be on your mind and my mind today. And what you find with Paul, he regularly returns to the story. The gospel is the story of what God has done, what God is doing, and God, what God will do to restore and reclaim everything. That's the big story, the gospel. And Paul will often return to that gospel, and he'll retell it, 
because he wants to emphasize some particular part of that story that the people he's writing to need to have a hold of right now, given the challenges that they're in. Okay? So when he's writing to the people in Corinth, they had forgotten the implication of the cross. And so Paul talks about at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, he says, I preach Christ and him crucified. And somebody says, well, Paul, don't you preach Christ resurrected too? Yes, I do, but all I want to talk about is the crucifixion right now. Because the crucifixion reminds us that we're people who walk with Jesus on the way of the cross. We need to be people who are humble as we anticipate God's ultimate triumph. Right? So in, in here in Timothy, he says, Timothy, you need to remember the resurrection. And then he does something that's very unusual, is he puts descended from David, from the bloodline of David. And what's odd about this is why these two truths and why does he put them in that order? Because obviously Jesus descended from the line of David before he was resurrected, right? So they're out of chronological order and why these two things? Well, the answer to this is in the context. Come down to chapter 2 with me for a moment. And here's what we want to see. Come down to verse 16. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Okay? Now, the reason why the resurrection is so important is because a distortion of the biblical teaching about the nature of the resurrection is what is plaguing the church at Ephesus. Right? It's the challenge to the gospel, the story of how God has saved and how he is saving. There's a misrepresentation that's happening by these two leaders in the church. Right? So they're saying that the resurrection has already happened. Now, in your, in your notes here, let me fill out A under your notes here because this is our first point we want to make here. What does Timothy need to remember? He needs to remember his resurrection, Christ's resurrection, as understood within the gospel it is a now, that's the first term, it is a now and a not yet thing. Okay? A now and a not yet thing. Okay. Now, the point here is the false teachers are saying, you've already been resurrected. The resurrection has already occurred, right? Well, in Paul's teaching, when anyone believes on Jesus, they're resurrected. They're made new. They're made a new creation, right? Eternal life, which is the life that we have from God, God's own life it's himself, he imparts that to us and it brings us alive. It makes us a new creation. But what's clear is that we're still waiting for our resurrection, which will involve our bodies and our complete person, right? So if you were to say to Paul, Paul, are we resurrected now or not yet? Paul would say, yes. Okay, wait a minute. Are you re am I resurrected now? Yes. Am I not yet resurrected? Yes. But you need to understand, you have been made a new creature. You have been made alive. You've got new dispositions. You've got new potential. You've got new possibilities because you've been freed from the burden of sin. You've been freed from its power. Now you can submit your life to God. You can follow Him. That's a new potential you have. You've got a new mission, a new identity, right? All that's happened. But you've not been fully conformed to the image of Christ because you still struggle with sin. You still fight the darkness in your own soul, right? It's still there, right? So this is why Paul is going to say later on, Christians will fall. They can be faithless. Christians can stumble, right? This is why there's so many, even the encouragement to Timothy, remember, Timothy, don't forget this. Well, what's the consequence? If you forget that, you'll mess up your life. Don't forget it. Remember, remember, right? This is why, you know, throughout Scripture, you need the Scriptures to continue to tell you who you are day after day. You need a time with God to let Him, because you're being bombarded day after day to tell you everything opposite. You need other voices. You need to be around another person with wisdom who loves and follows Christ so that sometimes when you've lost your mind, they can remind you of who you are, right? Right? They can remind you. They can stay and say, wait a minute, you've lost, you've lost track of that. That's not who you are. That's not what matters. Okay, I love you, but don't go down that path. Because right? sometimes we get swamped. We get caught in it. And so they're saying that it's what they've turned the resurrection into, and we won't go into this in detail here, but the idea is that the resurrection, if it's already occurred, means that I've already arrived spiritually. And so I'm kind of 
impervious to sin. I know everything, and it it leads to arrogance. It leads to a naivete about the, the impact of sin on their lives, right? And they're no longer really waiting for anything to happen out in the future because it's already happened right now. And the posture of a Christian today are words like watching, waiting, yearning, longing, right? Persevering. Well, if you've already arrived, none of those terms make sense if you're already there. And also, they've made the resurrection something that's largely spiritual, that doesn't involve the body, right? And so, these false teachers are telling people that if you're really resurrected, you shouldn't care about the body. And so, if you read about them and back in 1 Timothy, they're teaching the people that you should be free from the body and its appetite, so they're forbidding people to marry back in 1 Timothy chapter 4. They're they're skewed in their understanding of the nature of the Christian life. And so, Timothy, the important truth you need to understand as I've taught it to you as one representing Christ, as an apostle of Christ, that the resurrection is a now and a not yet thing, right? So, and then the second one here, B, let me fill this one in here, is that remember his bloodlines, talking about Jesus, remember his bloodlines is understood within the gospel. Christ's work fulfills God's past promises and speaks of his faithfulness and power to fulfill the promises yet unfulfilled, right? So, Jesus is who? He's the one who descended from David. Well, who was David? He's the, he's the, he's the Davidic, he's the king, right, of Israel, and he was the one that God promised, if you want to go back and read it in 2 Samuel chapter 7, He was the one that God promised that one of his heirs, one of his descendants, was going to be the one who was going to establish a kingdom that would never end, the king of all kings, right? The king of all kings was going to come and establish the kingdom that David couldn't establish, Solomon couldn't establish because they were flawed. We're waiting for the Davidic descendant to come, right? So Jesus is not just any guy who went up on the cross. He's the Davidic king. That's where he gets the title Christos. Christ is the anointed one, the Davidic king. That's why it's Jesus Christ, right? The Davidic king. That's a, so well, God has been faithful to his promises and Jesus' death and his resurrection shows God's faithfulness and his power. So Timothy, trust him. Remember that. And remember the storyline. This is all a part of the storyline. The story hasn't fallen apart. You need to go back to the story. God has been faithful. Christ came. He died. He's resurrected. And now you can trust him that he's going to ultimately return and establish everything that you long for. So hold on. Hold on to remember that, Timothy. Right? Don't let that go. So that's the the key ideas that he has for him there at the beginning. And, and as I come to the end of this, this section here, I, I think for myself, um, uh, what is the truth in your personal situation or for us as a church in the moment of our cultural situation that we need to remember? Right? I, asked my, I, I asked my wife this the other day, and, and, and as we pray together, I hear my wife say this often. And, and this is tied to her own, her own moment. And, and she says this regularly. Um, no feeding from Pastor Greg or anything along those lines. This is just my wife regularly prays, God, thank you that you are God and I am not. And I need to remember today that you're God and I'm not. I ask another one of uh, my daughters. I, I need to remember that God's really in control. That things are not out of control. That God's working his purposes out. I need to remember that today because I have a tendency to kind of fear that, that things have just fallen apart and things are going to hell in a handbasket and nobody's at the wheel, right? I, t- I tend to think that, right? So I need to be reminded of that truth about God. Some of that as I need to be reminded of my identity. For some people, it's that you know, I need to be reminded, who, who am I today? I'm not, I'm not just th- this guy who lives in, in America. I am a, I'm a, a, a son of God who's been redeemed by grace, who's had God set his love on me, and I didn't deserve it, and he's committed himself to bring me to the goal for which he saved me today, so I'm secure in his loving care. I have every resource today that I need to face the challenges that are coming my way without losing my mind, without going crazy, without taking it out on my wife and my kids and all those. I have those resources. I need to be reminded that's who I am today. 
I'm not somebody who can only get three people to follow me on Instagram, right? That's not who I am, right? Or I'm not somebody that, that gets to make up my identity by whatever I think or whatever might make me popular by naming that identity. No, no, I'm actually created by God. I had certain limitations and certain potential, and I need to accept those, right? And sometimes I need to be reminded of the fact, you know, hey, I have certain physical capacities, and I have other ones that are not. Some people are just better athletes than I am. If you're an athlete, you just need to remember, God, I, I want to perform to the best of my ability, but if I can't be happy when somebody else outperforms me, there's something wrong with me. Now, I can go back and, and work harder. I can do those things. But there will be the case very few of you will be the best in the world in something. Okay? Most of us all, the wannabe athletes that I know, that I grew up with, there's very few of them that went on, right, to play college. And there's a lot fewer of them, like zero of them, that went on to play pro. Even though if you talk to them at a certain stage in their life, they were all going to be pro. Right? And, and there was something obviously wrong with everybody else because they didn't see their inherent proness, right? Uh, whatever it was, right, that I should be there. Well, no, I'm sorry. That person just runs faster than you. And no, they didn't cheat, right? They're just faster, right? And it's okay. But there's something right in a person that says, okay, I, I've, I've exercised to the best of my ability. I've trained well. And when that person beats me, I can walk up and say, man, you're gifted. What a great job. Whether you play a musical instrument, whether you're academically inclined, whether it's the job that you do, whether it's the lawn that you're trying to do to establish yourself with a superior lawn in your whole neighborhood, right? Whatever it is, right? All those kind of things along with, there's something right about understanding who you are and accepting that, okay? And a person who doesn't, a believer who doesn't accept that is often a person that is riddled with envy at other people who have what they think they deserve. And un inherently underneath all of that, they're just telling God, God, you didn't give me what I deserved. I deserve something better. I deserved a better body. I deserved a better location. I deserved more money. I deserved these things. And God, I I'm, just, I'm just angry and I'm bitter and I'm sad. And if I had those things, I would be happy. And God's saying, I love you too much to let you make those an idol. You need me and you have everything that you need for life. Right? So I don't know what the truth is, that you, but Timothy needed to know about the resurrection because it was all being blown up, right? It was being misrepresented. So that's the issue here, right? Now, second thing here, um, Paul then, in verses 9 and 10, gives a picture. Paul gives a picture of what enduring hardship looks like. The believer who remembers Christ's resurrection expects adversity, right? That's one thing about the storyline. The storyline says, I should expect adversity. I'm not surprised by it. I shouldn't be surprised when I get tempted. I shouldn't be surprised when I find a, a brother in Christ or even a sister in Christ sometimes losing their mind and walking away and being stupid. I shouldn't be surprised that, that, that I get a bad report from a doctor from some time. Right? I'm not talking about, in, you know, you say, great, that's, I love that diagnosis. No, but we shouldn't be stepping back and saying, God, how could you let this happen to me? That doesn't fit with the story. And God says, no, 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 you need to go back to the story. You need to go back to the story. And so uh, Christ expects adversity, yet presses forward in the face of adversity with a confidence that God's saving work proclaimed in the gospel and experienced by belief is unstoppable. All right? So here's what Paul says. He says, uh, he's given Timothy his own point of view. He says, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Okay? Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Okay? So here, one of the truths that he is encouraging to me, God's work is unstoppable. Right? The, 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 the diagnosis you got the reversal that you got, the, the poor treatment that you got, the rejection that you received, right? That didn't stop God's work in your life. And if he has saved you and if you've submitted to him, everything that he promised you is going to happen. Okay? All of the things that you really fear, they've been removed. All the things that you really long for, it's coming. Okay? 
It's unstoppable. God isn't, so Paul says, don't look at these changes as if they're indicators, right, of, of somehow God's purpose is falling. No, 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 no. I know the story. I know that we live in a time where people who are rejecting God and resisting him, they're going to reject his people. Jesus told us that. I'm not surprised by that. Timothy, don't let the chains, the outward circumstances fool you. Don't let this hospital beds fool you. Don't let this rejection fool you. Don't let this firing fool you. Don't let this adversity fool you. God's still in charge and things are moving forward. Don't, don't let it fool you. He's unstoppable. God's unstoppable. Timothy, hang on, right? And, and God uses, another thing here, God uses his people as the means through which other people step into God's blessing, right? So the people that God is bringing to himself, the chosen here, well, how do they get there? Well, by his people proclaiming the good news of Jesus. You're the means through which God brings people back into a relationship with himself, into their true identity, into true blessing, right? So as Matt's at work, Right as Paul's at work, as we're in town and we're interacting with people, the people that don't know Jesus, right? We're God's means to introduce them to Jesus, and God's going to use. It. It's amazing, right? As one pastor said, it's amazing how many people you get to see come to know Christ when you're sharing Christ. Right when you're sharing Christ and representing Him, it's amazing how you get opportunities, right, to see God bring people to Himself, and so Timothy. Paul, Paul is there, and again, Paul's got a positive outlook, but it's a realistic outlook. It's not some, you know, Pollyannish outlook, right? It's, it's that I don't know why these bad things are happening to me. This is incongruent with God's purposes. No, no, no. God is at work. I understand there's going to be difficulties in this moment. Jesus prepared us for that. So, Timothy, keep moving on because God's word is not stalled, right? And I say this to, I say this to all of us who have somebody that maybe we've shared Christ with over the years, right? God's word is unstoppable, right? And, and, and I don't want to be the one who loses faith by stopping praying as long as somebody that I know who doesn't know Jesus, as long as they're alive, I'm going to pray for them. As long as they're alive, I'm going to pray before I see them that I want to use the time that I have with them the best. And again, if they, they stiff arm me and say, I don't want to hear any more about your Jesus, okay, I'm not going to press it on them but it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm still going to be on my knees praying for them to open their heart to Christ. And I don't care whether it's a brother or sister. I don't care whether it's a mom or dad. I don't care whether it's a child, right, or your neighbor, or, your, or the person who's made your life horrible, right? So Paul, he's not, he's not just hanging on, but he's continuing on mission that is a heart broken for people to be righted with God, Right? So he's not made people his enemies. He recognizes the opposition, but he's declaring Jesus for their blessing. It's a key idea. All right, now, the final thing then is he gives Timothy, right, this number four, he gives Timothy a memory aid, right? That's a weird two words, memory aid, right? For Timothy that brings out the relationship between the present and the future. Now, I would recommend, once you understand it and have looked through it, I'd recommend you, re you uh, memorize this little poem in verse 11, 12, and 13, okay? Now, you can see in most of our modern translations, it's put in kind of a poetic structure, and the reason why it's put there is because it's a balanced set of, of stanzas, if you will, as you work your way through. And so, let's take a look at what, what he says here. He says, uh, he, he brings out the relationship between the present and the future that is rooted in a correct understanding of Christ's resurrection, now is the time to endure hardship in service to Christ so that we can experience the future blessings that attend present faithfulness. Right. Now I say this to all of us, and we'll come back to this later. A lot of us spend a lot of time trying to make sure that our lives don't have hardship. Right? And I'm not talking about stupid hardship. Right? This is the kind of thing, stupid hardship is where you're just an annoying, irritating person who has people that dislike you because you try to browbeat them with Jesus. Right? That's not the hardship it's talking about here. Right? It's talking about loving people, but representing Christ authentically and genuinely and openly and bravely, courageously. But you don't, if you keep trying to share Christ in a way that nobody ever finds it offensive, most likely you'll just be unfaithful to Jesus. 
And then number two, you'll probably never share it. I found a corollary, I've said this before, a corollary in my own life, the longer it takes for me in a new relationship I have with someone to mention my identity in Christ, the more unlikely it becomes that I ever will. Because it gets a little bit awkward after you've known somebody for a long time to tell them something that's the most important thing in your life that you've known them for two years and never told them about. That just doesn't seem to go together, right? It's like me saying, you know, I love my wife and she's the most important person in my life and I know somebody for two years and I never tell them I'm married. They just think that's creepy and weird, right? What kind of person does that, okay? So the issue here is, is Paul is going to enter that. The, the, the present needs to be lived in light of the future, right? So let me, let me work through this. And he says, here's a faithful word. Here's a trustworthy word, meaning it's consistent with the gospel. It's a faithful word. So I'm going I'm to elaborate on it a little bit, and then we'll come back and summarize it. He says, if we die together, this is Paul's, if we die together with Christ, if we participate in the benefits of his death by faith, right? So to say to you, die together with Christ, right? When we baptize somebody up here, right? If, you, if you've watched them, we always say this, buried in the likeness of his death, and we hold them down for five minutes, and then raised in the likeness of his resurrection. No, we don't hold them down that long, right? But we, we put them back to illustrate, right, burial. But what we're saying is that you participate in the benefits of Christ's death. Well, what has death accomplished? It atoned, it covered your sin. It provided for your forgiveness. It took God's just wrath that was directed against you away from you. So you now are just showing that you participated in that when you believed in him. So you died together with him. Okay? If we die together with him, we will also live together. Right? And that means we'll have the best of lives now and ultimately have all of life in the time to come. So if we die with him today, we'll live with him in the future. Here's the second one. If we endure, right? Endure what? In faithfully proclaiming the gospel for the sake of God's saving mission, right? And we do that by life and word. We live it out in our marriages. We live it out at work as the way we do work. We live it out in our conversations, on Facebook even, right? We live it out. Well, if we're faithful in that, we will also reign together with him. And this is the promise of the biblical storyline. The faithful people in this moment, right, who serve Christ are going to know opportunities to serve him in the kingdom when he comes to establish it. And if you want to read about this moment, which we're not going to now, you can go to Luke chapter 19 and read about the parable of the minus, right? As we invest the resources that God gives us now, on behalf of him, when the king returns, we'll get the opportunity to serve alongside of him in the kingdom. So if we do that now, we'll enjoy that in the future. Then, this one's a little sobering, if we deny him, okay, and let me be clear about it. denial means to disown. It's the term that you'll hear sometimes in political speech, to disavow, to disclaim knowledge of, or disclaim any connection with, or responsibility for. It's to repudiate someone. Okay. If you disown Jesus now, he will deny or disown you when you stand before the judgment seat of God. Okay, that's pretty bracing. Right? If you deny him now, he'll deny you then. Right? And this is the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 7, just to give you in verse 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did not we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name or do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Okay? Now, what Jesus is getting at there is denial doesn't have to be somebody publicly standing up and say, you know, hey, EBC, I just want you to know I disown your Jesus. That's pretty open. There are people that will do that. Now, this is somebody often, this can be somebody who says, okay, I, I think that you can be a good person, and I think religion has a role in my life, but the idea that, that I need God to completely save me and do for me what I can't do for myself, no, no, I, I, I think that if you're a good person and you do good things and you treat other people well, when you get there, you're, you're, you're going to be fine. And God says, well, then why did Jesus need to come and die for you if you could save yourself? You just disowned Jesus, right? You disowned him, right? And it comes with all kinds of religious talk, 
but you've disowned Jesus. So that's the issue here. And Jesus knows whether you own him or not. Right? And then the final one, he will remain, if we are unfaithful, right, in our call to faithfully proclaim the gospel, if we fall down, we trip up, which we will, he will remain faithful because he's not capable of denying himself. So simply put, the posture of any one of us toward Christ now determines the posture of Christ toward us in the future. Okay? So briefly put these, for those who own Christ now, you are dead to an old way of life and made alive to real life now and you're waiting for it yet to come. For those who serve Christ faithfully now, you will be blessed with the privilege of ruling alongside him in his coming kingdom. Disowning Christ now means he will disown you at the judgment. Owning Christ now means he will own you at the judgment. For those who are unfaithful in your service to Christ now, that will not jeopardize your ultimate salvation, but it will and it may affect the role you play in his coming kingdom. So the present needs to be lived in light of the future. One of the things about the biblical storyline, right, that needs to, is that life is not all had right now, and the most important things can it be experienced now, and that the things that you choose today need to be informed by the future. Right? Now, so let me, let me wind up with some lessons, and I'll fill in these things here from our, our time, and we'll conclude. To the God resistor, right, if you're here today and you've rejected Christ, and, and I, I say this with, with, with a longing that you'll come to know God's grace and mercy. Scriptures make it clear, right, that God longs for you to come back to who you are, into a relationship with Him, and to understand who you are and what life really is. He longs for that. God is a God who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, is what Paul reminds Timothy of in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Right? So God yearns for that. But the two things here, first one, if you reject Christ now, Christ will grant you your desire forever. If you reject Christ now, Christ will grant your desire forever. Second one, bow before Christ in worship today, come back underneath his benevolent loving rule Come back to your identity. Come to swim in the path of His grace and mercy. Bow before Christ and worship today before you bow before Him in judgment tomorrow. He's going to wind up His admonitions to Timothy by reminding Timothy, Timothy, in view of the appearance of Jesus Christ, the one who is about to come to judge the living and the dead, Timothy, Declare the good news that the kingdom is open because there will be a time when the door will close. Now, to those of us, by God's grace, who know Christ, here's what he wants to say. Remember, the gospel is essential to enduring. You need to recount to yourself the story of where you are and who you are. And what God is up to, you need to be reminded of that everywhere so that your life doesn't get shrunk down to the difficulties you're having with your toddlers at home, right? You need a bigger picture of what it means to be a mom or a dad so that it doesn't get shrunk to the difficulties that you're facing and you remember that you've got, you're actually working with lives that are immortal. These are kids that will live on forever. You can't afford to be petty and neglectful. You can't afford to slough off. You can't afford to neglect them. Right? You've got a weighty responsibility, and it is weighty, and you need to pray about it and be engaged. You've got to remember the bigger story. When you're at work and the colleagues, are, they're, 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 they're immortals who are going to have a heaven or a hell in their future. That needs to energize the prayers for your work and make it less about you being successful and more about you being the aroma of Christ where you are. Those are the kinds of things where it needs to affect us. The gospel needs to shape us. We shouldn't be surprised that life is difficult. We shouldn't be surprised that we find opposition, right? It needs to inform us. Second one, swimming with the current of God's love and mercy on mission with God today will mean that you will have to endure the hardship of swimming against the cross currents of a world in rebellion against Him. 
the cross currents. Nobody wants your marriage to succeed. They don't care. Matter of fact, to the degree that you do succeed and you enjoy it, it makes other people envious and angry. God, they don't care. They don't care about that, right? And those kind of things. And I, I say, I know that's harsh to say it, but people expect it to fail. They don't know how you're, you're enduring it, how you can still love her or him, right? And they expect you to engage in kind of conversation about your spouse that's degrading or stereotyping them, right? So those are kind of, if you're going you're to express cross currents, if you're going to be a, a worker that at your job that's going to be a person of integrity who's not going to steal things, who's not going to lash out, even if you have very poor leadership, and you're going to try to take a little bit from them because you deserve it. If you're going to be a person who acts with integrity, who talks to people in power instead of talks behind their back and does that, you're going to, you're going to encounter cross currents. People are not going to want you to operate that way. Right? If you're going to be a person in our church who doesn't talk behind people's backs but goes after people right, and speaks to them directly, you're going to go against cross currents because there's a lot of people who just want right, to chew up people without actually dealing with the problem, right? You've got to go against cross currents. You've got a culture that wants to take every bit of your money and throw it at everything that doesn't matter for the future, as if you're building up all your treasure right here. And God's going to say, hey, invest for the future. Invest for the future, right? Now, third one, the best of lives now and the fullness of life in the future is not the path of ease, comfort, and popularity. It's not the path of ease, comfort, and popularity. I, I'm going I'm to say to you as, as a follower of Christ, and I know it's hard for me sometimes. I'm, I'm a Bible guy. I get paid to do what I do. Sometimes that irritates me because then it makes it sound like, well, you get paid to do what you do, so don't, you, you know, it's easier for you. All I'm just saying is I'm as fallen as any of you are. And there's a tendency for me to, to know a lot and not live it. And I can be a guy who knows the right things to say and stand, hide behind it. But if, if you are, are aware of the idea that life is not ease and comfort and, and that you're going to not be popular, what, what you know is that you're going to put some rigor into your Christian life. You're, you're going to feel like today... I should expect the fact that when I go to study my Bible, I'm in a battle. Right? How many of you have told me in a battle? I, I get there. Well, you need to sit there and wrestle with it, right? And you need to sit there and wrestle with it. And Lord, I need to understand this. Lord, I'm crying out for wisdom. Lord, I'm going to talk to somebody until they get it because I need these truths to help me today. Because I'm afraid of listening to all the other voices. And I know they're pummeling me every day. God, I need to. And so I need to hear you. I don't, I don't go to the Bible right, as, as some sort of little pill, like I get one little verse and it gives me, inoculates me from everything. No, but I need to rethink about who I am and what really matters today. Got to be the wife I need to be, to be the husband I need to be, to respond to my parents, to, to interact with my friends at school, Lord, to not lose my mind, Lord, to not get lost in the computer somewhere and, and degrade my life and other people. Lord, please help me because you're not in neutral territory, right? I'm not panicked, but I'm going to go after it, right? So it's not even popular. And then th next one, life is not found in avoiding hardship. It's not found in avoiding hardship, but in embracing hardship, right? You know, one of the simple hardships that we can, we can avoid is opening our life to each other, right? And engaging with each other's life. It's easier, right? I, I find myself, I'm, maybe it's, I'm getting old now, right? I'm older, old. But, uh, you know, the old thing about old people, they get set in their ways, right? They like things a certain way. When Rana and I are at home, you know, our house is pretty tidy, right? Rana has trained me well over these last years, and it's pretty tidy, right, in our house. Something happens when we have, you know, 15 or so people over, right, or six or seven or eight people, and some, you know, four or five little people, things just aren't as tidy as they were uh, when they left, right? And they're just... We just love them, having all those kind of things like that. But after a while, right, when you open your life up to people, you have to adjust. You have to be flexible. You have to put up with stuff. You have to care less about the pristine look of the stuff that you have. You have to be more genuine about it. And they get to see who you really are past what you look like on Sunday morning. 
And so that kind of hardship, we, we avoid it. And therefore, we make our relationship sterile and shallow. Right? Um, next one, hardship does not indicate that you're on the wrong path. How many people have you ever heard, well, I, I'm having difficulties. I must be doing something wrong. No, maybe you have the right enemies. Right? And if you're following Jesus, well, you, can, you can be sure that Satan is going to oppose you today. Jesus is the one who told us to pray, Lord, deliver me from the evil one. Right? I, I, I'm in. And then, uh, next one, faithfulness and hardship go hand in hand. Follow Jesus. Okay, this next one here. Follow Jesus, trouble follows. Okay? Now, it's the good hard, but if you follow Jesus... Right? You're going to have the evil one after you. You're going to find yourself where you're identifying with Christ, and you're going to, you're going to find opposition for your identity with Christ. Right? The, it is no singular achievement for a Christian to live their whole life and never face any opposition for their following of Jesus Christ simply because nobody ever knew that they were one. That's no achievement, nor is it to always present a Jesus that never actually challenges the people in your life. Okay, we talked about this book, the sharing Christ with people. One is you, you live like a Christian. You're a person of integrity. That's what you should be minimally, right? The middle one is, is you tell people you're a Christian. And you give your testimony. You talk about what happened. I was talking with Adam about this, Adam Mays, about this here. The third place is really where the hard one is, which is where Jesus goes every time and says, you know, hey, I'd really like to commend Jesus to you and ask you if you've reckoned with Jesus. That's the hard one. Right? Now, again, it takes wisdom all right, for all of us to do that, but there's no singular achievement in figuring out, I lived my Christian life out, and the people around me didn't know that I was a believer. Okay? Then Christians, this one here is true, Christians stumble, but Christ won't let them fall. Christians stumble, but Christ won't let them fall because He's committed to bring you to the goal for which He saved you. And then finally, Avoid the hardship of the path of Christ now and no future disappointment. Avoid the hardship of the path of Christ now and no future disappointment. I'm going to ask Grayson to come uh, here. And would you just pray with me as we uh, conclude here this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, As we come to you this morning, Lord, we come to the God who has been faithful always. Lord, that you, uh, from the storyline of Scripture, that from the time that Adam and Eve walked away from you, Lord, you intervened, Lord, in your mercy, uh, Lord, to uh, still leave a way open for them to come back into the relationship that they had forfeited when they rebelled against you. And Lord, you set in plan a motion a motion, a plan that, that has been realized in Jesus. And Jesus came, he died to take what we couldn't pay and to provide for us what we couldn't earn. And Lord, he asks us, uh, Lord, to put down our arms, to stop running away, to stop stiff-arming him, to stop trusting in ourselves and, and to bow before him so that we might be restored to the life that we were created to enjoy that we might be restored to ourselves to know who we are and the Lord that we might be equipped and enabled Lord to love the people around us and Lord we know that you have set in motion this plan and you've moved it forward and uh, Lord you have left us with your spirit Lord to do your work until you return and Lord you've given us everything that we need to do your mission today and you're a God who around the globe everywhere is calling people to yourself, Lord, in Africa, in Asia, Lord, in Europe, in South America. Lord, you're, you're busy accomplishing your saving purposes, Lord, and it is moving forward. And Lord, just as you accomplished everything to this point, Lord, you will fulfill what you have done. So Lord, help us to trust you, Lord, to live in this moment of our story. Lord, help us not to falter, uh, to step back. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here that doesn't know you today, uh, Lord, would they turn from the path of death unto death and turn to the path of life unto life. Lord, I pray for those of us who know you, Lord, please help us, uh, Lord, to, to trust you in these hard moments if we're facing one, to turn to you, to look to you. And so, Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.